just one touch I feel the presence of heaven And just one touch My eyes were open to see My heart can't help but believe Come on There's nothing that our God can do There's not a mountain that He can melt Oh, praise the name Makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Just one word, you hear what's broken inside me. Just one word, and you revive every dream. And just one touch. one touch my eyes were open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our God can do there's not a mountain that he can move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our God can do come on there's nothing Church, what a week of uncertainty, stress, and disunity for not only our country, but for many of us here today who are watching online. But thankfully, our God, he gives us some words of assurance of who he is, and those words are found in Isaiah 46. He says, remember the things I have done in the past, for I alone am God. There is, I am God, and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan, it will come to pass. For whatever I, I do, whatever I wish. For I am ready to set things right, not in the distant future, but right now. Amen. So as we sing the words in these songs, anything is possible, and there's nothing that our God can't do, let's remember that we can sing them with confidence and in unity. Because despite who you are rooting for for the presidential election, there is an election that is long over. And the verdict is out, and our God is on the throne, and he is, he is sovereign over all. And quite honestly, God, there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. When they sing this out, let's believe it. There is power in the name of Jesus. Come on.
hoping maybe for, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't be there. Cause the God I serve knows only how to try My God will never fail. Sing that with confidence. My God. No, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see you victory. I'm gonna see you victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see you victory. I'm gonna see you victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Only belongs to you, Jesus. Only you have the power. Come on, there's power in His name. See it out. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, every war He wages, He will win. No, I'm not backing down from any giant, yeah. Cause I know how this story is. I know, say it out. Yes, I know how this story is. Oh, I'm gonna see you victory. I'm gonna see you victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Yes, you do. You turn it for good. Every time, every time, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I believe it, Jesus. But you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Oh, you're turning it around. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Oh, you take it. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn. Turn it for good. You turn it in a You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm gonna see you victory. I'm gonna see you victory. Every voice for the fire.
we go through in this life, this is our confidence that Jesus is still on the throne. He's still reigning. And that whatever we're facing, we can have a confidence that Jesus is working even when we can't see it. So let's trust him. Let's turn our attention to only him, setting aside everything that's else that's going on. Let's look to our Heavenly Father as you sing us. Come on. Sing with faith. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. Worship you. You are here, working in this place right here. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Cause you are.
church. My name is Brooke and I am the director of spiritual development here at Central. And first, I just want to say thank you for coming. We hope that you genuinely do feel welcome and comfortable worshiping with us um, alongside us here. If this is your first time, we'd love for you to help us to get to know you a little bit better. You can do that by filling out a welcome card um, at the Connect Center, or if you're joining us online, you can fill that out on our website. Well, um, I think we've said it already, but I think it's safe to say it's been a cr pretty crazy week. Um, I know for, for most of us, we've had a lot of moments of confusion, probably a lot of moments of discouragement too, but I know, at least for us here at Central, we've seen a lot of really powerful moments too. This past Monday, we were able to host our 24 hours of prayer event, where we as a church committed to praying for, pray for our world for 24 hours. And it was so awesome that so many of you committed to pray throughout the day on your own, but we also were able to open up our Augusta location three different times for prayer and worship. And it was so powerful to see people on their knees, to see some completely flat on the ground, completely humble before our God. It was such a powerful reminder and a beautiful reminder too that our God hears us, our God sees us, and none of this is a surprise to Him and we get to cry out to him. But like we talked about last week in our message, we don't wanna be a church that just prays once and is done, prays to begin with and is done from then, but we want to keep praying. So right now, that's what we wanna do. Wherever you're at right now, I invite you to just join me in praying for unity, for us as the church to actually be able to show love to one another, to show Christ's love to one another. 
and for the healing of our lands in all of the ways that we need it. So right now, would you pray with me? God, we love you. We thank you for who you are. You are good and you are capable and we know that you care for us. I pray that we would just be able to be unified as, as your church, as people who say that they're followers of you. I pray that we would put our differences aside and come together on the one thing that we can agree on, and that's you. I pray that we would be able to, to love one another well, that the world would be able to look at us and see something different, that they would see your love that is so different than how the world is reacting to one another right now. And God, I just ask for healing. I ask that you would heal our land in all of the ways that we need it, from sicknesses, from injustice, to everything that's going on, disunity, God. There's so much, but, but you know, you see it, and you are so capable of getting rid of it, of fixing it in a way that only you can. So God, we just ask for that. We ask for you to move, and we know that you will. It's in your name I pray, amen. You may be seated. I encourage you to keep praying for in the weeks to come, in the months to come, in the years to come, remembering that none of this is a surprise to God, and he will continue to move even in difficult and unknown circumstances. But right now, we want to continue in our message series in this house to get to know, um, to learn how we can better uh, learn about our God. Um, so now, let's get ready to welcome our lead pastor, Dan Coleman, after this short video. O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Well, if you are new with us, either watching this message online or maybe in person, I want to personally welcome you to Central Church and go ahead and give a quick shout out to our locations, and that is Augusta and China, but the biggest and the bestest, that's not a word, but the bestest shout out goes to our newest location, and that is our Topsum location. If you happen to be in the room with me right now, would you help me welcome our newest location, Topsum? And they are worshiping, they are meeting together at the Sky High Conference Center there in Topsum services on Sunday, 8.30 and 10.30. Last week was sort of our, our kickoff, it was our soft launch at least, and that's going to continue through the month of November, and it was fantastic. It was an incredible start, a great beginning. In fact, we've got a couple of pictures we'll put up on the screen right now so that we can all see and celebrate together. Uh, we had many people who actually uh, left, moved from our Augusta location to now go and worship closer to home in their community and to reach out to their neighbors. But last week, the first week, we also saw brand new people, new faces walk through the doors and join us. We also had last weekend our very first baptism in our new location, Pastor Steve's son, yeah, Jordan. The coolest little guy you will ever meet, besides my kids, um, he got baptized and, um, and it was just an incredible start, a solid start, so cool, such a great beginning and we're celebrating it still and we're looking forward to the days, the road and the growth that is coming that is ahead. But before we move ahead, I want to go ahead and also say hello to our fourth location. You didn't know that we started a fourth location this week, but it's been a busy week. And this week we went international. 
And uh, what I mean is that we actually have a team that is serving right now in Haiti. We got a picture of them that we can put up for you. They are serving in Haiti with our partner ministry that is healing Haiti and serving well this week. And so for this this ministry that is really supported by missions trips and missions teams going down, they had not seen one missions team get onto the field since the pandemic began until Central Church went down this past week. We are pioneers. We are down there. We are serving well. And um, that missions team is viewing this service online right now from their mission home, the guest house in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. So to you guys, we love you. We are still praying for you. Can't wait to have you back soon this week and hear about what God did around you and through you. Right now, we are in week two of a message series called In This House. And uh, that title is really inspired by some of the signs that we have seen popping up around our towns. Right now, there is this growing trend of people placing these these signs in the front yard of their property, and they read, in this house, and then there are sentences and statements that follow. And so the signs may read, in this house, um, we believe in science, or in this house, we love all people, or in this house, we believe all lives matter, so on and so forth. It turns out that in a really, really divisive time, people are looking for a way, they feel the urge, the need to communicate to the world around them what they stand for, what they believe in, their values, their convictions in that house. And it turns out that that is exactly what we want to do around here, like all the time, right? That's nothing new for us. We're trying to do that around here every single week. So in this series, we are talking about what we value, what we stand for, our convictions and our beliefs in this house. Uh, Growing up, I grew up down on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, and um, the, the house that I grew up in sat directly in front of a house of worship. I actually grew up on the same property as the church that we attended and the church that my father actually pastored for many, many years. Some of you grew up and you know, maybe you had a pool or a swing set in your backyard. I had a church parking lot in my backyard, which is not as cool, by the way. I would have taken a trampoline or, or something like that. Um, but this, this church that I, I grew up in from, man, day one when I was born, it was, it was small, not just the building, but the amount of people. It was a small church. It was simple. It was relatively, I guess, compared to today's standards, unimpressive. But I am so grateful and I am so thankful for my background and for my upbringing in that small, simple church. Because my background and my upbringing really gave me a love, instilled in me a love for about three things. And as I share these three things with you, I'm kind of describing myself to you. First, my my upbringing in this small church gave me a love for the church, and I'm not just talking about the building. From day one, I knew that the church was so much more than a building. It's a people. It's a family. It's brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible also tells us that the church is the plan, not a plan, the plan to reach and reach out to this broken, disjointed, hurting, and lost world. And so right now, we need to place value and emphasis. We we need to see the church as vital right now, more vital probably than ever before. My upbringing gave me a love for the church, God's church, but it also gave me a love for evangelism. And that is a big word, and that's just a big way of saying that this message, this gospel, this good news that we preach about and we sing about week after week after week and we enjoy in here is not meant to stay in here, people. It's meant to be enjoyed in here, but it's meant to go outside the four walls of our church buildings. We got to bring it out there because God has told us in his word that it is his desire that none out there would perish but all would come to him in faith and in repentance through Christ. And so we have to 
evangelize. We've got to get this gospel. We've got to get the word out every day, every week. And I am also so thankful that my upbringing, my background in a small little church gave me a love for the Bible, the scriptures, the stories that are there, the word of God. And that love continues into this place, this house today. And so this weekend, we are making a statement together. And that statement is this. That in this house, the Bible will be read and obeyed. In this house, the Bible will always, it will always be read and we will seek to apply it, live it, live by it. The Bible will always be read and it will be obeyed. And, And when you think about it, that is like the most, you know, expected statement I could make, right? I mean, this is a church, I am a pastor. But at the same time, if you think about it some more, that is one of the most controversial statements I could make right now. Because it is one thing to own a Bible, a lot of people do, but who in this modern world still reads it? And who in their right mind obeys it? Well, we do. No apology, no shame. In this house, we do. But we are reading and we are obeying what exactly? Well, King David in the book of Psalms gives a pretty good descriptive answer to that question. Psalm chapter 119, verse 105. David says to God, he says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and it's a light on my feet path. What is the Bible? It is a lamp. It's a light so that we can see the right path to take. It is direction. And to so many people, that statement alone, that verse, it's offensive. Because really what we are saying, what David is saying is that without the Bible, you are simply stumbling around in the dark, not knowing which way to go. And most people don't want to hear that, it turns out. Try it. (laughs) Most people don't want to hear that. Most people don't like that. But for those of us who are believers, and for us in this house, we agree. We agree. The Bible is direction. It's the right path. It's everything. It is the way, the truth, and the life. And so what I want to do in this message is I want to give you some reasons. I want to share with you some reasons why in this house the Bible will be read and obeyed. And and most of the time I would have about three reasons or three points for you because everybody who knows anything about church knows that a good sermon always has three points. And if you are a good preacher, you have three points, a poem, and a funny joke, and there you go. That's, that's the recipe right there. Now, everybody can do what I do. You know all the secrets. But this is how you know that this message is going to be twice as good. Because I don't have three points in this message. I have six points in this message today. So at all of our location security teams, just like we talked about, if you would lock the doors right now, because... <laughs> I got a lot of people who are looking afraid and scared going, we got six points and uh, I don't know how long I can stay in this place, but I need a captive audience for this one. And uh, really, I'm just kidding with you. We're going to move through these points uh, at a really good pace. But all I want to do is I want to just give you a lot. I want to equip you with a bunch of reasons today so that you know with confidence and certainty why in this house, in this family, why the Bible is read and why it is obeyed. Six different reasons, and here is the first one. In this house, the Bible will be read and obeyed because, first, it's all-encompassing. The Bible is all-encompassing. The Bible is so much more than just a list of do's and don'ts. The Bible is so much more than a book to be reached for and opened and read from once a week. The Bible is a guidebook for every day. 
In fact, the Bible is actually even more than just a book. The Bible is a collection, 66 books written by 40 different writers over the course of 1,500 years. And the Bible records books of history, what happens, books of prophecy, what's going to happen. The Bible contains books of poetry and song and wisdom to give us a sense of calm and peace and a sense of sensibility, which I think that we really, 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 really need right now. The Bible also contains eyewitness gospel accounts of Jesus himself, God's son, God's plan for our salvation. It records his birth, his life, what he said, where he went, what he did, what he taught. It even records for us his death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave, his ascension into heaven. The Bible gives us Church history, how all of this started and came to be. And it also has many letters from many church leaders to us, church people, telling us what to do and how to live in this life while we wait for the next life to come. And if somebody was, was to ask you, you know, if you were reading a book, a pretty typical question somebody might ask you if you're reading a book is, what's that book about, right? Right? But how do you answer that question when it is directed to the Bible? Because the answer is, it's about, it's about everything. It's about everything. It is all-encompassing. And because it's all-encompassing, it refutes every negative claim against it. You know, people might, might claim, oh, oh, the Bible, it's, it's outdated, Okay, the Bible literally records and speaks to the beginning and the end. There is no expiration date on the Bible. Uh, other people might, might claim negatively, oh, it's irrelevant to life today. Okay, the Bible speaks to families, uh, parents, married couples, singles, young and old. It speaks to work and play, laws and leaders, birth and death, life and afterlife. It speaks to everything. It's relevant to it all. It's all encompassing. Here's what the Bible says about the Bible. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, it says, for the word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It speaks to the heart. It gets down to the point of every issue we wrestle with today. So what are you wrestling with? What are you struggling with today? What questions do you have? What answers do you need? Hey, the truth is we, we are... We are all different, right? But thankfully, the Bible is all encompassing. And when the world and the word are at odds with each other, guess what? The Bible, it's true. It's true. And we know that the Bible is true because we did not write the scriptures. In fact, scriptures means written by God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Hey, the same God who spoke, he breathed, and he created the heavens and the earth using earthly writers wrote the scriptures. And I know that takes faith. I know it takes faith to believe that. I know it takes faith to believe in God. I know it takes faith to believe that this is his word and it's true. But it is not blind faith. A very respected and renowned uh, professor, his name is Dr. Bruce Metzger of Princeton University, 
So this is not the dinky Bible college that they for some reason let Dan into. This is Princeton we're talking about. Dr. Bruce Metzger uh, once wrote and he once said, after you take the 20,000 lines of the New Testament, it is safe for any scholar to say that 99.6% of the Bible has been corroborated or backed up by other historical documents. Church, that is a massive statement. That's a massive statement. History, science, math, other documents throughout history back it up. And I know that takes faith. I know it does. But if you already, already by faith believe that there is a God with no beginning and no end, by the way, then it actually doesn't take much faith at all to believe that in his spare time he wrote a book, right? And gave it to us. And if he wrote it, it's true. All of it. It's true because it is the word of God. And because it is the word of God, here's the next reason why we read it and obey it, because it's authoritative. The Bible is the authority. You know, there is a a saying that a man's house is his castle. And if you want to see your three-bedroom ranch that way, you you can do that. You can have at it, buddy, right? That's, that's, yeah, that's my castle, right? The only problem is you are not even the king of your castle. You're not. I I am not the highest authority or final word even in my own home. In my home and in my life, there is a final word and there is a higher authority and that is the word of God. It is authoritative. It says in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. It says, And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is. It's the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. The Bible is the authority. It's the authority, and the Bible has a work to do in you. The problem is, the problem is, you have a problem with authority. Did you know that about you? You do. We like our word. We like our way. And the problem is, it turns out that most of the time, our way is at odds with God's word. So what's it going to be? What's it going to be? Because there is not room enough in your house. There is not room enough in your life for two masters. In this house, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you bring to the table. It does not matter what title you've been given. I am not the highest authority in this place. There is a higher authority, the highest And that is the Bible. That is the word of God. And I know it's not very popular. It's not very popular to go out and tell people, hey, your word is not the highest word. There's bigger, there's better, there's higher. But I also think that's another reason why we should read and why we should follow and obey the Bible. Here's another reason, because it's unpopular. The Bible is unpopular. Do you know how unpopular the Bible actually is? Do you know what the Bible has to say about life before birth? Do you know what the Bible says about sex outside of marriage? Or what it says about traditional marriage between a man and a woman? Or what the Bible says about how you ought to handle your money or how you should treat your enemy? No, the Bible is not winning any popularity contests these days. It is unpopular. It actually says so in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. It says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. 
but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You know, to so many, it's foolishness, it's outdated, it's irrelevant, it's unpopular, but also, here's the next reason, also, it's necessary. The Bible, it it is necessary. I just wonder, do you look at our world, especially this week, and go, oh my word, (laughs) we have drifted so far away. We have gotten so far off of the path we should have been on. Anybody think that? Anybody feeling that? I think we do, right? Well, if we want to get back, if we want to return, we have got to return to our Christian roots and foundations. Some of you, I talked to some of you throughout the week. Do you want to heal? Do you want to save your marriage? You are going to have to bring the Bible back into your relationship. Do you want to set your children off on the right path? Then you are going to have to bring the Bible back into your house. Let me ask you, I'd love an answer. Do you want to reach your one? Do you want to reach your one? Have we forgotten with everything going on, have we allowed it to distract us from our mission? To pray for one. To reach one more. This is a time where we can't forget about that. We got to be focused on that right now more than ever before. People are lost. People are confused. They're dying. Do you want to reach your one? Do you want to see your one come to know the salvation that Jesus freely offers them? Then here's what that's going to take. Here's what it takes. Here's what's necessary. In Romans chapter 10 Verse 10, it says, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and you're saved. Go down to verse 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So if you want to reach your one, it's actually going to take even more than prayer. It's going to take even more than an invitation to come and have a you know, a good experience in a good church. They are going to have to, at some point, hear and accept the word of God. Salvation by faith. Faith by the word. It's necessary. It is necessary for salvation. But we know that the world is is always going to invent And the world is always going to try many other efforts and things to to find purpose and to find pleasure, to reach salvation, to reach God. But all of these inventions, all of these efforts are going to fade away. In fact, the only thing in this life that is never going to fade away is the word God. Of God. And that's the last reason why we read it and why we obey it, because the Bible, it's lasting. It's lasting. It's not going anywhere. I've got news for you, and depending upon what side of the aisle you may be on, maybe this will be good news or bad news. I don't know. I I don't care. (laughs) But presidents, laws, leaders, policy, politicians, will come and they will go. They will, biggest amen I got. (laughs) They will rise and they will fall. They will be here for a time and quickly as this life vanishes, they will vanish away. There is only one thing. The word of God stands forever. Forever. It says in 1 Peter Hold that, get ready. First Peter chapter 1, verse 24 and 25. It says, for all people are like grass. Well, how so? And all their glory is like the flowers of the field. How so? Well, the grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. 
hey, in an ever-shifting, ever-changing world, there is but one thing that remains, and that's the Bible. That is God's word. The good news. The good news that God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. That is the good news and that is the message that we are still week after week after week preaching to you today. Hey, we look outside of these places and and we know the world is a mess. The world is in chaos. But on this statement, we stand unshakable. On this statement, we stand firm. That in this house, the Bible will always be read and obeyed. The question for you is this. Will you make that a true statement in your house and in your heart today? At all of our locations, would you bow with me? Let's pray. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, and and maybe you'll you'll hear and notice that our worship teams, they're, they're coming to the stage because we want to sing, we want to worship together. We're not done doing that, and we're going to be singing a a song that that is one of my my favorites. It's called Build My Life, and I think it does such a good job just capturing and declaring this firm foundation that we have through Christ and his word. Lord God, we are so grateful, and we are so thankful, Jesus, for you, for you, for who you are, for your love for us, for your word. God, thank you so much that everything is shifting around us. Everything is a mess. Nothing remains, it seems, but there is one thing that remains. There is one thing that's never going to fade away, and that is your perfect, true, holy word. Lord God, we love you, and we thank you that we are not walking through this world and through this life alone. We thank you that we have your word. It is a light. It is a lamp. It is everything that we need. So God, I pray that right now we would rely upon it. We would read it. We would seek to live by it, obey it, apply it more than ever before. God, I pray that we would commit ourselves to what we need to be committed to right now. God, I pray that as we we align ourselves with your word, and it changes us, from, changes us from the inside out. That would also change people in the world around us, we pray. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. At our locations, would you stand to your feet? Let's sing about this.
every day we get to build our lives upon the truth of God's word. We open up his word and we are guided by his spirit and there is power in that. Right now we've been talking as a church about the importance of unity. And so we wanna be united in reading God's word. So we have created a Bible plan that goes through the book of First Peter. It's available to you right on our website as well as on our app. And we challenge you to join us in reading through that book together and seeing what God does through that. As we give through our worship today, um, I want to remind you that at each of our locations, we have Bibles that are in the backs of the seats. And if you're joining us online, we'd love to mail you a Bible. If you don't have one, take that with you today. And as we give, know that your faithfulness is helping us to be able to do that. We never want there to be a moment where someone doesn't have the word of God in access to them. So as you give, thank you. You can give online on our website, centralchurch.me. You can also give on our app. And then if you're with us here at Augusta, you can give at our giving stations that we have in each of our spaces. We always say that if we go broke giving out Bibles, that's not a bad thing. So thanks for being here with us today. We hope to see you next weekend. Have an awesome week.